Hi, everybody. Wow, look at the quality of talks we've been hearing. It's just mind-expanding being here. I know all of you agree with me on that. And let me remind you, I am just so grateful to be here, not simply because I was invited, but because of this spate of airline delays and cancellations. I'm so happy I'm actually standing here in front of you and not doing this presentation from a hotel room in Munich. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right. So I work for Freeland. That's an international anti-trafficking organization. And um, because of the nature of work we do, most of our work is with law enforcement agencies. And when I started about 20 years ago, and even now, the sphere of law enforcement is overwhelmingly male. It still is. And we were having a discussion about this yesterday, about how difficult it is to work when none of the faces around you look like you. So one thing I found very helpful, go into a situation without preconceived notions, offer people practical solutions to their problems. And that's the key part. As wildlife conservationists, we love animals. We want everyone to love animals. We think everyone loves animals. And surprise, surprise, not everyone loves animals. So we imagine you have two um, toothpaste companies. Toothpaste A says, use our product. You'll get sparkly white teeth. You'll have tingling fresh breath. You'll you know, get the boyfriend or girlfriend of your dreams. Your boss will give you a promotion. That's toothpaste A. And toothpaste B says, use our product. You will help us meet our quarterly quotas. You will pay for a bonus for our CEO. So which toothpaste are you going to want to use? Obviously, the one that solves your problem. So that's what we've been doing, solving people's problems and making sure that they realize wildlife trafficking is their problem. It's everyone's problem. So we go to police agencies, the ones who dismiss wildlife crime as not very serious crime, and we show them evidence of, look, how, much, how many other laws they're breaking. They may be breaking um, cyber crime laws. They may be breaking uh, firearms laws or um, narcotics laws while conducting wildlife trafficking. We go to health authorities, and we say, look, wildlife trafficking is going to cause the next pandemic, like it already has. We go to counter-terrorism authorities and say, look, in these areas of the world, wildlife traffickers are using their profits to buy illegal ammunition. We go to counter-corruption agencies, and we say, wildlife traffickers have set up this supply chain by bribing officers A, B, and C. And because they've created this supply chain of compromised officers, they are now passing other contraband as well. We go to um, revenue intelligence and tax authorities and say, look at the vast amount of wealth that wildlife traffickers are earning. Clearly, they're not paying tax on any of it. That's, so you should be looking at their assets and seizing it, because none of this is declared. All of it is illegal. And so by making wildlife trafficking everyone's problem, as it should be, we get much more traction than by going to people and saying, hey, love animals because you should, and it's good for the planet. So during the last 20 or so years I've been working, I've done a lot of things, like here yeah, I'm pretending to be a stupid tourist, taking pictures with wild animals. We were working with a police team that was going after the people who were trafficking in slow lorises. Um, I've seen some pretty heartbreaking scenes. I'm not going to show you too many gory pictures because I've seen so many of them, I don't want to see them again and again. This was a seizure of lion bones, um, this was a seizure of African ivory. You can just imagine how many elephants were killed for that. And for all these seizures, remember the actual seizures represent a tiny percentage of the entire amount of trade. Law enforcement typically multiplies seizures by a factor of 10 to estimate how, many, how much of the trade is actually happening. All this is very depressing. But also, I've had opportunities that no one else has had. Like, I've got to go into deep into protected areas where civilians are usually not allowed. This was a picture in northeastern India just seconds before, all, before three of the big males charged at us simultaneously. Um, 
I've seen scenes like this where a mother tigress with four full-grown cubs just walked within one or two meters of our vehicle. And for those of you who are big cat people, you know how difficult it is for a tigress to raise cubs to adulthood, let alone four big, healthy cubs. She's an excellent mother. And so through all this, the one key thing I've realized is the key to saving animals, the key to protecting wildlife, is people. And when I realized this, I was a little bit annoyed because I'm in it for the animals. I love animals. When I was a really little girl, my you know, dream life would have been to live in the jungle, and I'd have an elephant friend who would shower me, and a couple of monkey friends who would throw fruit down at me to eat, and life would be perfect. Well, life is pretty good, not that perfect. But the one thing I have realized is you have to work with people. And let's take a moment here to talk about frontline staff, rangers, forest guards, who are out there every day facing wild animals and malaria and ticks and fleas and poachers' bullets and wild animal attacks, all to protect the natural heritage that belongs to all of us. So we do a lot of frontline trainings, and I'm really, really heartened to see that there are many more women joining frontline trainings. We saw that in a couple of uh, talks uh, yesterday and day before. That's a really good step. We've also realized that just go doing trainings and coming back is kind of a one-off solution, so we've started to develop legacy tools that can continue and be used by people long after we've left from a place. So this, for example, is a smartphone app that we developed. We found that a lot of frontline officers, particularly those at borders, people who have to make instant decisions, like is this consignment in front of me legal or illegal, very often they were letting a consignment go because they weren't very sure and they didn't want to be the one to take the risk of actually stopping the consignment. Maybe it turns out to be legal, and then their bosses just come down on their heads like you are stopping business and you are creating problems. So this app, it's free right now. You can all download it and play with it. I welcome comments. But basically, it's designed to answer some very simple, non-technical questions and get them to the place where they can decide, yes, this thing in front of me is legal, I should let it go, or this thing in front of me is illegal, I should seize it, and I will not get into trouble for seizing it, because it's clearly illegal. Now, among the other tools that, and trainings we've been doing is reaching out to the private sector, because we realize there's a huge amount of wildlife trafficking happening on planes. These animals that you see here, these are not actual animals. These are very, very lifelike replicas that we've used in aviation sector trainings in, the, in Africa, in Asia, with many, many airlines and at many, many airports. And what we do is that we train airport and airline staff to be the eyes and ears of law enforcement because they're the ones who first come into contact with the animals on planes. And then the other very important thing is we've also got to train them on how to protect themselves so that they don't catch a zoonotic disease if they come across a consignment of wildlife. Also very important, do not seize the wildlife in a way that will mess up the case for law enforcement. We have seen times when airline industries, you know, very happy with seizing something that's obviously illegal wildlife. They've taken selfies with the wildlife, opened it up, and of course, that contaminates the evidence and it's impossible to prosecute a case. So it's about training um, airline officials, border guards, um, people at marine ports, people with, uh, working with postal, logistics, courier companies. How do you know that this thing in front of you is legal or illegal? If it is illegal, who do you call? Be the eyes and ears of law enforcement. Now that, it's not all we do. A lot of our work is, like I said, with law enforcement. But apart from training, we do a lot of investigative support. This picture on the bottom left, you see the man in the mask. He looks really, you know, nondescript, like he could be just anyone. He is a key member of one of the largest syndicates headquartered in Lao PDR, of all the places in the world. But they had tentacles like octopuses sucking up wildlife from all over Asia and Africa. 
And in fact, in South Africa, they were running this really clever scheme where at that time South Africa did allow trophy hunting of rhinos. So they would get a professional hunter to kill rhinos in South Africa, but the application for the permit to shoot the rhino was actually made in the name of Thai prostitutes who were working in South Africa. And these women obviously had never handled a gun, could never shoot a rhino. So the professional hunter would go shoot a rhino, ostensibly this woman would have shot it, and the horn would be taken out, sent back to Vietnam, allow PDR. So what we did is we gathered a lot of information over a lot of years on this syndicate. And instead of only working with wildlife authorities, we went to the anti-money laundering authorities in Thailand, and we told them, look, this syndicate it's, a, it's running like a company. It's like, it's a well-oiled machine. They've got all these cars, these properties, gold, you name it. They have every asset you can think of. Clearly all from their illegal wildlife trafficking. And we handed over all that evidence. They worked on it for a couple of years. They did a really good, thorough job. They arrested him. So this picture is from his arrest where he's actually signing that, you know, he's been arrested. Right now, this guy is suing us for damaging his reputation and harming his business. So we must be doing something right if wildlife traffickers are suing us. But also, just arresting people, just taking their money, just seizing their assets, eventually these are all stopgap measures. It's like performing emergency surgery. The chronic problem still is that wildlife trafficking is not everyone's problem. So during the last two years when the pandemic was obviously such a disruptor of everyone's lives, we formed a consortium with a number of like-minded um, organizations, and not only wildlife organizations, we've got food, we've got agricultural security, we've got sustainable farming, lots and lots of different types of organizations and individuals to create this alliance called End Pandemics. It's on a website, you can check it out. We welcome you to join if you like, um, everyone's welcome. And we created this sort of solution map. So if someone comes to us and says, yeah, we want to help, we don't know what to do to help. So we have this like map available for download. You can have a look at that as well, because ultimately, well, pandemics clearly did become everyone's problem. And it wasn't a lot of work to convince everyone that, hey, this pandemic is really disrupting your life. So by framing it as everyone's problem, as a pandemic-causing agent, wildlife trafficking can actually be, you know, the thought of wildlife trafficking can be dispersed much more efficiently, and you can get more people motivated about it. And then lots of people, sometimes my friends, they ask me, so what's your end goal? You know, you can't obviously have every single wildlife trafficker arrested, and I know that's not a realistic goal. For me personally, I got into this line because I love animals, and now I just find it outrageous, just so outrageous, that even now, animals are expected pay for their right to survive on the planet by being used by humans. We're looking at wild populations of dolphins who are still being captured for aquariums. We're looking at baby orangutans who are still being captured for use in entertainment venues. We're looking at consignments of macaques stolen from the wild bruised and bloody because they've been cudgeled on the head and stuffed into bags, being transported to be smuggled for medical research labs. We still look at wild animals being killed for fun and sport. I mean, come on, people, <laughs> this is 2022. We don't need to prove ourselves by killing animals and using them for entertainment and for fun. So that actually is my personal mission, not to get all the bad guys arrested. But if there's a large enough group of people, if there's a majority of people on this world who agree that wildlife has a right to their space on this planet, 
not because they're serving a purpose for humans, but simply because they have a right, they have a value in themselves. If enough people agree, I think I will have succeeded in my personal mission, and I really invite all of you to join me in that. Thank you.